what's going on YouTube? So, uh, for the request of one of my viewers on a comment on uh, the Roost Guide, I think it was the Roost Guide, I'm going to, today I'm going to be giving you guys a um, army control and micro guide. So, I want to start this off by saying I am not an expert at micro, like not a pro level expert. Quick background, if you don't know, I hit Conqueror last season. It was my first time hitting Conqueror. And uh, this season, I'm in the Diamond range. I've been one game away from Conqueror twice, and then I fell back lower into Diamond. I plan to hit Conqueror this season. I plan to keep improving and get better into the Conqueror 2 range, you know, and Conqueror 3 someday. But, guys, I am not the best Age of Empires player. I'm not the best at Micro. Um, but I do have some information that can help you guys. I've been playing for a year and a half now, so I definitely have some tips for you guys, but I'm not a micro god. So the reason I say all that is because I think that you can watch this video and, and learn the basics maybe of micro and army control and that kind of thing. But then what you should really do is... Um, Take what you learn from this video, and then when you're watching like a pro level game, just watch how they micro their units and try to learn from that based on what you learn here as well. So we'll get right into it. So I've loaded up a custom game just so I can spam out some units and talk to you guys about some things. And then um, I have a couple scenarios I'll show you guys from some of my other games as well. But um, right now we're just going to we're going to need. I'm going to want to get all three of the unit types out. We're not going to bother with military schools or anything like that. We're not playing a real game here, right? I'm just trying to show you guys the basics of micro and army control. So while all that's building, first let's talk about attack move and how the attack move works. So, attack move is a staple in any RTS. And, um... As far as I know, I haven't played other RTSs, but I know they have attack moves. I've played StarCraft 2 a tiny bit. But, uh, when you attack move, your units that you attack move with are going to move towards that area and attack anything that's in their way. So, let's say that the enemy base is right here and they're, they're mining gold here. Um, and there's a house out here or something. You're, you will prioritize enemy units, so um, if there's villagers mining the gold, and you attack move to right here, your unit will arrive and it will prioritize attacking the units. And then um, you will have to stop it from running into like a town center and dying if he pulls back the villagers. But if there's no nobody mining, uh, your unit will just walk up and attack like the house or the mining camp. Um... So, in, in a big fight, it's the same thing. Your units are going to be attacking um, the closest units to them in the fight. So, let's just get out some units. So, that's something to be aware of. Now, it is really important that when you're moving your, uh, moving your army and there's another army in front of you, like, you, you pretty much always want to be attacked moving. Like, you don't want to be walking your units... Because they will not attack. Like, if you don't use the attack move, they're not going to attack. So, like, I could walk this into the base and just die. And it's not going to attack anything. It's not going to automatically attack anything. Now, if I park it right here, and there's villagers on the gold, it will start attacking those villagers, right? But if you're moving the unit, look, it doesn't attack the wolf. It's moving. Now, if I let it stand still, it starts attacking the wolf. So, these are just kind of like the very, very basic mechanics that you may or may not have caught on to, but it's important to know this stuff. Because, yeah, you can walk your whole army into your opponent's army, and it could just die if you're not paying attention. That's why it's important to always pay attention to your army. So, um, let's get up some units. Oh, I did build any houses. Oh, unfortunate. Let's get a bunch of houses. So, 
we're going to talk about um, defending versus attacking first. So, um, if you are the one defending, you are always going to have the um, advantage as far as uh, as far as um, reinforcements go. So, if uh, you know French is in your base, that you're playing Ottomans. You know, at the early the early stages of the game, you will likely be defending against the early French knight raids, and maybe even an archer archers as well behind the knights. And that gives you a little bit of an advantage because not only do um, your units reinforce faster from the buildings. They have much shorter distance to walk. But you can also garrison and use your town center to deal damage to the army if he gets too close to the town center. Or if you have a defensive tower, you can garrison in the tower and use that to your advantage. So in that way, defending has its advantages. But there's also an advantage for attacking. And the advantage for attacking is that the opponent might be dealing damage to your economy. It might be idling your villagers. And might be killing villagers and that is the attacker's advantage right if uh you're just fighting in your base the whole game and you never make it to the other side of the map and do any damage to your opponent um you are likely to lose the game very likely to lose the game so um the next thing i want to talk about is the importance of raiding right so let's say that there is a big french army here and you notice, okay, he's chilled out a second to build rams. At that time, it would be a great idea to take your sapahi of four or five of them, or however many you have. Don't take all of them, actually. You know, you might need some for the archers. But yeah, take a, a small group of sapahi and just try to get some raids in. If you're playing against French, you know that they're probably going to be out on the map gathering food. So you can go for, like, the exposed food and just look around for villagers and try to kill them. And that will distract your opponent from the push now. And also, you might get villager kills, which will uh, slow down their economy, slow down their unit production. And these kinds of things will make a big difference in the fight. Next thing I want to talk about, um, and I will get to micro and all of that, guys. That's, that's coming, I promise. But I, there's a lot of things to talk about first. Um, avoiding keeps in town centers. Guys, you you really you rarely want to be diving the town center, like especially before you get ranged upgrades in the blacksmith. Once you get the uh, iron undermesh, you know you can be diving a little bit more often to get villager kills and etc. But especially with like archers and spears, most of the time you don't want to dive them under a town center unless you just have such an overwhelming force you're going to destroy it really quickly. As like on an expansion TC. But um Yeah, you will lose games, diving keeps especially. Like town centers do a lot less damage than a keep. Keeps are extremely dangerous. You don't really want to be attacking into keeps without siege. Uh and the more upgrades that are on a keep, the more dangerous it is. Like I've lost a lot of games this way when I when I was starting out because I just didn't realize how bad it was to be attacking into the keep. I was like, oh, I have more units than him. It's fine. Let's attack. And then I'm fighting under the keep for 10 seconds. All of a sudden, you don't have more units than them anymore, right? Because that keep deals a lot of damage. If they garrison in it, every uh, garrison's flat shoots arrows. Uh, there can be a sprinkled upgrade on it. And then the scariest thing of all is boiling oil. And if you were, your units are right underneath the keep when that boiling oil comes down, you're going to lose a lot of units really fast. Like, really fast. So... Um, I don't have, like, good examples of that to show you guys, because it'd just be too hard to show all of this stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's what I want to talk about. With the keeps and town centers. Make sure you have siege, or you go around the keeps to deal with keeps. Alright, scouting and reading your... Um, well, actually, the next thing I was going to talk about is trading units. So... Let's say, I know I'm, I'm playing Ottomans right in this, but don't worry about that. Let's say that you're playing Abbasid and you go for a multiple town center play. And you're playing against French. 
and you you should always be scouting your opponent's base. So you scout your opponent's base, and you see that they didn't take any stone, so they're not going for a town center. They're they're just building, and you notice they're just building units to attack you. And you're Abbasid, you've got your second TC down. At that point, guys, you just have to hold and survive to win the game, right? Because you're on two TCs, you're Abbasid, you're booming, and he, your opponent is all in trying to attack and end the game. So what that means is that if you take some bad trades, if you take a bad fight, as long as you fight your opponent off, and they don't push in and completely destroy you with rams or kill a bunch of eco, you're going to be okay, and the trades, the trading is good for you, right? So, like, if you trade evenly in a fight with a player who's on one town center, and both of your armies are fully gone after the fight, you're in the advantage because you're economically ahead. So if you are on two town centers, your opponent is on one. Yep, that's it. You just have to have to trade units, and every trade is good for you at that point. Now the opposite is true. If you are the French player, who is, or the Ottoman player, or the whoever, right? If you're on one town center and your opponent's on two, three town centers, or your opponent just hit Imperial with the Palace of Swabia. Or whatever you're and you're just on the one town center you're on a timer right and if you're if you have to keep your army alive at all costs because if your whole army dies your opponent will be able to build up a new army much quicker because they'll have a better economy so these are important things to remember uh during combat so let's talk about scouting and reading your opponent's army this is super important guys like before you even start making units like maybe not before you make your first military building but as you continue to add military buildings and etc you all you have to know what your opponent is doing so the second they hit feudal age you need to scout and this isn't necessarily army control but this is just it is though at the same time you need to scout and see what units your opponent has if they're massing a bunch of uh horsemen because they're expecting your archer ball you're gonna need more spears right and, um, yeah, it's just really important to know what your opponent's doing so that you can be prepared for it. You don't, you don't want to just make a big ball of archers and go into the fight. Oh my god, he has 20 horsemen. I've got three spears. You're probably going to lose the fight at that point. Alright. Now we're going to get into the juicy stuff, what you're all here for. Uh, control groups, target firing, micro, that kind of thing. So, let's say that your opponent does have a decent group of horsemen, but now you've got the spears, so you're ready to fight. And you've got a little bit of Sapahi, you got a little bit of everything. Stop making units now. Don't, don't want to make any more units right now. Now, you should always be making units when you're fighting, right? Like, you don't want to stop making units. If you're, if you guys, if you're having a big fight out here, you cue your production buildings forward. And, oh... Let's, let's stop real quick, guys, and talk about my hotkeys for the production buildings, and then we'll get more into the micro. Personally, this is what I did a long time ago, and it changed my game. You can do whatever you want. There's other ways to go about this. You can you can watch other creators' guides on YouTube about how they, how they do this kind of thing, but this is what I do. Um, let's go to controls, building selection. So... You can select all military buildings and tab between them with F1. That's what a lot of players do. But a long time ago, I made the switch. And I I took the end of the numbers, right? So the first six numbers I keep for unit control and hot keying buildings inside of the game. But 7 through 0, I took and I applied that to all of my uh, military buildings. So, select all barracks is 8, select all archery ranges is 9, select all stables is 0, and then select all siege workshops is 7. So this means that when I'm in a fight, you know, I have my archers on 1, I've got my spears on 2, i got my sapahi on 3, and if I'm about to take a fight and I know I want to be queuing my new units forward, bam, 9, bam, 7. Now, or bam eight, bam zero. And I just all of a sudden all my production buildings are queued straight to the fight. Really, really helpful. 
So let's talk more about micro. Let's say we're fighting a French, not a French, or just a player that has a bunch of cavalry. Or we can say French or whatever. It doesn't really matter, right? Say they have a bunch of cavalry and they have a bunch of archers as well. Um, the way that you want to engage is you want to keep your spearmen alive. They're very, very important if there's a bunch of cavalry. You will attack move with the archers, so they can be attacking the whole time. And the spearmen you micro. So the spearmen you'll keep, like, right behind the archers. And then as soon as the cavalry comes forward to attack, bam, attack move with the spearmen. And then you can attack move with the archers again. And if your opponent's good, they'll move their cavalry back. And then... It's important, guys. Do not let your spears just follow the cavalry into your opponent's archers. Pull your spearmen back. This is the kind of micro um, that will help you win engagements. So, um, it's hard. Uh, like, I couldn't find a good example of this in any of my recent videos. I didn't want to use another player's content to, dis to, to show this. But you can watch games, guys. Like, like, just watch pro games and you'll see or any, any higher level games, you'll see this kind of micro happening in the fights. They keep their spears around the archers to protect the archers. Unless they have such a big force, it's time to just attack move. So, that is uh, the first bit of micro I want to show you guys. Just um, keeping your, uh, your spears near the archers. And um, these different formations, I'll talk about when to use those in just a minute. But, uh, yeah, most of the time, you don't necessarily need to use them. Uh, keeping your archers on spread can be good if there's, like, mangonels or lance decks or something. But if you're fighting um, archer versus archer, let's forget about the spears. Let's say both you and your opponent are just massing archers. You'll want to go for the line formation because that, that way more of them will be attacking at the same time. And, um, yeah, you'll just do more damage that way. But let's get out of the netter. I'll talk to you guys about Meta Micro as well. So, yeah. Um, that's kind of like the basic Micro with, like, feudal units. Um, and then with, like, your Sapahi, you're going to want to try to wrap them around onto archers and avoid spears at all costs. So just kind of the opposite of what I was telling you to do with the spears, right? It, at the same time, you're going to be wanting to take your Sapahi around and try to get, like, a wraparound attack on the archers. And, um... If they run into spears, you just just pull them back. You're you never want to engage into to a massive spears with your cavalry. Never, never, never. Not unless you just have way more units than them. And uh, knights knights can take down. Um, you know, knights can take down spears if you have more knights than spears, right? But horsemen, it's a different story. Horsemen will get shredded. And the other thing I want to show you now that we have this meta out. I personally will, I like to keep my meter on the hotkey with, um, with my archers. And it's important, especially in like, you know, you're having big archer battles. In the fight, you'll micro, you'll just click on your, um, click on your meter pretty often and just micro it to the back. You want to keep your meter out of range of the enemy's archers, but in range of your units so that they're getting the bonus. And your metters are going to get sniped sometimes. It's it's tough to keep your metters safe at all times. So it's good to have multiple metters if you're playing Ottomans. Sometimes and just give yourself that little extra buff against losing the bonus. All right. Let me look at my little outline here. So we talked about control groups. We talked about unit compositions and feudal. Like you want to be countering your unit's composition, but... Um, as the game goes later, there's more and more types of units, and um, this is not, I'm not going to go super into the unit counter system, like, there's lots of videos on YouTube if you don't understand the unit counter system. Very briefly, you know, archers counter spears, uh, horsemen counter archers, spears counter horsemen, right? And then as you move into castle age, there's, there's just more and more layers to that. Crossbowmen counter armored units. So a good mass of armored uh, of crossbowmen will absolutely shred knights, right? So you don't want to be building a lot of knights against a big mass of crossbowmen because, you know, in theory, cavalry is good against range units, but not in theory, but like they are, cavalry is good against range units, but a, a big mass of crossbowmen will actually 
just completely shred knights. So against crossbowmen, you want a mangonel or you want horsemen or sapahi or, you know, whatever. You don't want armored units. Uh, men-at-arms are countered by crossbowmen as well because they're armored units. And men-at-arms are very good against um, regular archers or, um, you know, non-armored units. If you're just taking a, an attack move fight, right? But if your opponent micros really well, men-at-arms are actually pretty slow. So sometimes you won't do the best against the archers. So there's just lots to think about, guys. Like I said, I'm not doing a total unit composition or unit, um, unit guide here. So if you want to learn more about the units, there's lots of guides for that on YouTube already. I think Age of Noob has, has one, and there's other channels, so you can just search for that if you don't understand the unit counter system. Um, when to just attack move. So I know some, somebody asked this, like, when do you just attack move? Because if your army is way bigger than your opponents, you can just attack move um, and just kill their army, right? Let's say that your opponent is right here, and you see that he has, uh, he has got like six knights, and he's got like 15 archers. Well, look at what you, you've, I've got 30 archers, I've got 13 spears, and, you know, five sapahi, I'm gonna shred that army. So, at that point, you don't necessarily have to worry about the micro, and you can just attack move, and this is gonna work very well, like, even... Guys, even at the very highest level, I've seen players just attack move when they when they know they have a lot more units. And it's something I still do all the time. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's also something that comes with time, guys. Like, all of this stuff takes a lot of practice, but it's going to take time before you're able to just look at your opponent's army and you're like, oh, yep, I can beat that, right? Like, that just takes time and experience i can't go through every scenario there's so many right there's so many so many scenarios so i can't go through every scenario and be like oh uh, you should just attack move here oh you should never have attacked move there right it's just it just comes with experience and time and being able to see your opponent's army and judge like okay my army is better okay my army is worse i need to pull back so that's what that's that's the next thing i want to talk about guys you don't want to take bad fights in this game. Let's say the opposite is true. You're the French player, and you have five knights, and you have 15 archers, and you see this massive army from the Ottomans. You've got to pull back to your base and defend at that point. Do not engage. And you need to mass up as many units as you can to try to match that army. Because if you if you throw your army away, they're just going to be able to counterattack and kill you. Now... I said when you have a bigger army, you can just attack move, but you don't want to get too carried away, right? If you kill their army, that doesn't mean that you should just walk under the town center and just attack it with, um, like, 15 garrison villagers. Because with this force right here, you will eventually get whittled down, right? You need to have siege to attack the town center. So what do you do? I've killed his army. How do I do more damage? Just go attack everything that's out of range at the town center. Attack the wood line. Attack the gold. Attack the berries. Go deny resources while you build up siege for the kill. You do not want to stay under a town. Like, you can walk under the town center to attack for a second or two. Especially if you have a ranged armor upgrade from the um, blacksmith. Which is, by the way, one of the most important upgrades. But, um, yeah, you don't want to stand under a town center or a keep for very long at all. You, you just don't. So, it's better to, to surround your opponent's base, keep them trapped inside, and deny the resources they're getting on the map instead. Okay, what do I have next on the list? We talked about when to just attack move. Splitting your army. Okay. So, one thing you'll notice, guys, that I do a lot, if you watch my games, I try to do this a lot, at least. I don't always do it. And high-level players do this a lot as well. Say you're massing up units, you're building siege, you're about to go in for the big push, and your opponent's massing up units right here. This is a great time. Like, while you're while you're building the siege, I don't have these upgrades right now. Let's get them. Um, you know, let's say I'm standing here building the siege. 
This is a great time to split off a few a few raiding units and just go look for something to raid. Um and then on top of that, if you're attacking something like trade, like say let's say the Mongol player is you're playing against Mongols and they're trading, they can be really good to split your army completely. And in that case, I might not split my control groups into like I not, might not put my spearmen on two and my archers on one. I might just put this whole force on one. And put this whole force on two. And uh, we want to meter with both groups. So. Control one. Control two. And. Um, go attack in different places. Right? Like attack the market on this side. With one force. And attack the market on this side with the other force. And just shut down the trade. And there's other situations which you want to split your army. But that's getting into more complex. Like higher level stuff. You need to be careful splitting your army as well. You need to be aware of where your opponent's army is. Because if you split your army like this, and your opponent has a bigger force than this force right here, he can come and just wipe this out. And then all you're left with is this. And that might lose you the game, right? So these kinds of things, like, these are advanced techniques, guys. And it takes experience, practice. Like, it's not something I can just teach you, and you're just going to be good at it. Um, while we're at it, I've realized I should probably explain to you guys a little bit about control groups. So, easy way to do control groups. I'm just going to pull all the units back to the base right now. Now, let's say that you want to put all your archers and uh, meta on one. You can control click all the archers and that pulls up every single one that's in the area, right? So, we're going to wait till the armies get closer together. That way I can just... Just do this all at once. Yeah, so I'll talk about, like, how you control with these units quickly and efficiently. So you control click the archers, and it highlights all of them. All 30. And I just press control 1. Now all my archers are on control 1. Then I'll take a meter and I hit shift 1. So when you hit shift 1, that adds it to the control group. So if I want to add a second meter to the group, I'll hit shift 1. And then as my new archers come out, I'll hit shift 1 on them. And I'll show you that when the archers come out. And we control click the spearmen. You notice my archers are still on group 2 as well. So to fix that, I'll put my spearmen on group 2. That's what I want. So I control click the spearmen, control 2. And now the archers are all only on one, the spearmen are only on two. And my cavalry, I'll control click and do three. And they're only on three. You can use whatever numbers you want. If you're comfortable with your cavalry on one and your archers on two, that's fine. It doesn't it doesn't matter, right? And then as your new units are coming out, just highlight them. Shift one for the archers, because I want to add them to the group. Or if I'm making more cavalry, you'll hit shift three on them. So, these little things will help you use control groups more efficiently. Alright, we talked about splitting your army. Just talked about adding units to control groups. Let's talk about upgrades. Um, upgrades are extremely, extremely big in a fight. If you have, Especially, like, the more archers you have, the more important it is to have this balanced project... Or it's called uh, Steeled Arrow, the first one. I already got the upgrade. So that your ranged units are doing more damage. And uh, if your opponent's massing archers, like the more archers they have, the more important it is to get this, uh, it's called uh, Iron Undermesh, the first one. The ranged defense. Now these melee upgrades are not as important, guys. Get these when you have extra gold and when you have already gotten the ranged upgrades. Or if, if you're not going into archers at all, you don't need to get the ranged uh, damage upgrade. I always go for the ranged armor upgrade pretty much eventually in every game. Now, if my opponent's not massing ranged units, I won't go for it right away. But you want the ranged armor upgrade because it will help you diving town centers and that kind of thing. It'll help you take less damage from the town centers. So notice I just hit shift 2, shift 3, bam, they're all in the right groups now. Okay. Um, upgrades. The next thing I want to talk about with upgrades is unit upgrades when you hit the next age guys you don't most of the time you do not want to be engaging 
um, feudal age units into castle age units. So, if you have a similar sized army to your opponent, and they hit the castle age, you really, you want to age up yourself, and you don't really want to fight their units when they're upgraded. Um, because they will shred you. Like, veteran archers will shred regular archers. I mean, veteran units of any kind from the castle age will shred the feudal age units, right? So the second you hit um, castle age, your priority should be to um, to upgrade your units as soon as possible. Now, I'm going to show you guys a couple more things with um, once I mix in siege with control groups. And then I'm going to show you guys a couple of... Um, A couple of uh, examples of micro that you can do um, in some of my games, and then we're gonna call it a day. Um, I know this is a lot of information, so and I've probably missed some things. So just you know, if you have questions, just drop them in the comments. Um, but I want to show you guys what I would do. Some what I do pretty often when I have siege mixed into the to the mix. So let's drop a siege workshop. So we hit Castle Age. We'll go ahead and get the unit upgrades for Archer Spears and uh, Sapahi. And you also, when you hit Castle Age, you want to go ahead and mix in some of these higher tier units like the crossbows, the knights. You want to do this immediately when you hit Castle Age. Alright, we're going to get a couple mangonels real quick. So... This is an easy way to control your units in Castle Age once you've got Siege involved. Now, it is better to have multiple control groups, right? But sometimes at this point in the game, you're fo you're fighting off raids in your base. You're, fi you're trying to raid your opponent. And things just get complicated, right? So what I'll do fairly often is I'll just put my entire army on one. And I'll put my Siege on two. So, everything that's not Siege on 1, and uh, we're going to get off the spread formation for this. Everything that's not Siege on 1, and um, all Siege on 2. And this will just help you. This will just help you a lot, first of all, because if you're moving, let's if we move this all as one group with the Siege, see, look how slow the units move. They're going to move at the speed of the siege. It, it slows the units down a whole lot, right? But if you move the units independently of the siege, they'll move a little bit faster. And if you move the cavalry independent of, you know, everything else, they'll move... Um, even faster, right? So, that's something to note, right? If you have a big control group and your spearmen and your... You're moving your spearmen and your knights on the same thing. You're slowing your knights down. It's not always necessarily a bad thing. It's, a, it's like I said, sometimes it's okay to have all your units grouped together like this. But yeah, in this situation, I would put my whole army on one. I would put my siege on two. If I have sprinkles, I would put the sprinkles on three and the mangoes on two. And, um, yeah. Now, sometimes I might do more than that. I might get more complex than that. But this is an easy way to get started, right? Because I see players all the time moving their whole army together with the siege, and they don't have a control group on anything. This is a great way to get started using control groups. Just put your whole army on one, your siege on two. All right. I think that's about it, guys. So I just want to show you guys a couple of specific scenarios I have pulled up from some games I played recently. And might give you a little bit more insight on microing your army. Um, I, I, before we get into it, I'm sure I talked about this earlier, but... Yeah, like, if you're fighting, you know, you want to target fire spears with your archers, right? Target, target firing spears with the archers so that your cavalry can take engagements and uh protecting your spears so that your archers will be protected from cavalry i think i talked about that all that earlier but just wanted to reiterate all right i think that's about it for this 
So let me show you a couple of scenarios from um, some games I played recently. And uh, that'll be it for the guide. So this is um, a scenario where I did what I just showed you. And I had my whole army on one. And uh, my siege, I don't even know if I had it control grouped or I had it on two. Um, in this game, um, I got raided a little bit by French and uh, Feudal Age, and I noticed he was going Castle Age. I didn't feel like I had enough units to push him Feudal Age. So I went to Castle Age myself and uh, waited until I was ready to take the fight. So at this point, I was starting to feel ready to take the fight. I have a couple mangoes coming out. And you can see I'm raiding with two different two different units. These units aren't control grouped at all. I'm just raiding with them as I prepare to engage in the middle. And that's, it's just always something good to be doing, guys. Like, you'll be killing villagers and distracting your opponent from the main fight. So, bam, attacking the farms here. I already attacked the gold with those other units. And then the fight's about to happen in the middle. And what I notice immediately is that most of his army has crossbows and he has some knights as well. So in this engagement, I need to protect my mangoes and keep them alive, and the crossbows won't be able to do anything. So that's what I do. I just keep my army around the mangoes, so that the mangoes can attack the um, the big massive crossbows. And look at this hit right here. Oh, it's not that one. It's the next one. Look at this hit from the mangoes right here on the crossbows. Bam. Ten crossbows dead right there, basically. And I hit the archers and crossbows again here. Five more dead. And notice I'm not even fighting with the... Like, I'm not fighting with the other units. I'm just protecting the mangoes. And then, now that all the crossbows are dead, pretty much, it's safe to engage with my spears into the knights. And this fight... We had basically even numbers behind the fight, but the fight went so well for me, he just immediately surrendered. The other scenario I was going to show you guys, real quick. Um, this was yesterday. And uh, in this situation, I was dealing with Lancenecks from the HRE player. Now, the thing about Lancenecks, guys, and like I said, I didn't get into all the different units. If you want to watch a unit comp guide, that kind of thing is already on YouTube. Lancenecks have massive AoE damage. So, if your units are clumped together, and there's 5 or 6 or 10 or 15 Lancenecks or whatever, and they, they do their little swing with the two-handed sword, dude, if your units are clumped together, they will just disappear like it's scary they'll just disappear so what do you do you put your units in the spread formation and you target fire the lance next with archers lance next do not have a lot of armor so you target fire the lance next with your archers and you spread out your archers so they don't die in a couple swings from the sword and you'll see in this fight i have all of my archers on the control group one and i'm target firing the lance next see me clicking on the lance next i shift click them as well so that all the lands next die. And once those are dead, I can, I, you know, mostly dead, I can engage with my melee units again. Because I don't have to be worried about that AoE damage coming in. And you see, like, I had a lot more units than him in that fight. I maybe could have just attack moved. But I was wary, because I've lost fights like that, where it looked like I had a lot more units. But the lands next come in, and they just pop, you know? And your army's gone. That kind of thing is, um really important to to be aware of and to um that is a situation where micro is extremely important right target firing the land snacks spreading out your units yeah and obviously you also want to spread out your units against mangonels right you don't want to have a big clump of infantry um if your opponent has a bunch of mangonels you want to put your your archers in spread formation to minimize the damage and consider not engaging into the mangonels at all until you have springles to deal with them all right guys that's going to be it for my micro army, um, for my micro and army control guide. I, I definitely missed some stuff, guys. Like, like I said, this is all this, this kind of stuff just comes with experience and time played. But I hope that this can get you started. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. Like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what kind of guide you want to see next. And uh, thanks for watching, most of all. Have a good day, YouTube. Thank you.